are, everybody, live on Facebook, which is uh, very much the happening thing these days. Usually, um, I'm one to buck a trend. Usually, the almighty anti scene is a band to buck a trend. But every now and then, one is handed a fiat from above that things are going to be a certain way, and you just gotta, just gotta kind of go with the flow every now and again. Not all the way. We do swim against the current as much as possible, but we do take advantage of situations as they are offered us. Presuming that anybody out there can see and hear me, my name is Malcolm Tent. I am the Chief Executive Officer, Chief Financial Officer, Head Janitor, Secretary, um, General Jobsworth of TPOS Productions, which is a record company I've had since 1984. And I am also currently the bass player for the Almighty Anti-Scene. Yeah, yeah. Which would explain my presence here on the Anti-Scene page on this lovely Sunday afternoon. It's 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't know what time it is where you are, but hopefully it's a good time. Hopefully everybody is uh, in good shape, maintaining your sanity, maintaining your health, and doing what you got to do in these very bizarre times. I am here live on my telephone, and I'm also looking to see if, ah, uh, yes, there it is. I can monitor you guys on my computer. So I can talk to you on my phone and then see how everybody's reacting on my computer here at home. Isn't technology great? It can be. It really can be. So yeah, if you guys have any questions or comments, bring them on. When I'm done with my little spiel, I will address them. I will also be looking over to the right, to my right periodically to make sure you guys can see me and hear me okay. And um, I'm gonna ha I'm gonna say right now enough bullshit. Let's get down to the reason why we're here. And the reason why we're here is that I am acting in conjunction with the unimpeachable president for life of anti scene, Mr. Jeff Clayton. Mr. Clayton has been doing these really cool live streams on the anti scene page for the past few weeks, in which he talks about the history of the band told from the best perspective possible, which is, of course, his. Since it's uh, his band. He's been doing this since day one, you know? And um, I was like, you know what? That's a pretty good trend to jump on. So I'm going to jump on that trend. I'm going to hop on that bandwagon. We're going to see if the wheels of the bandwagon are strong enough to support my cumbersome bulk. And we're going to put that to the test right now. As I tell all of you everybody out there, my part of the story with the almighty anti-scene. Um, I've been on the periphery, in the middle of, winding my way in and out of the anti-scene story almost since day one. Anti-scene began in October of 1983, and my path first crossed theirs in the summer of 1984. So when I first met the band, they hadn't even been around a year yet. And that was coming up on 36 years ago. So I've, you know, I've had a pretty good vantage point. Um, having worked with them, having worked for them, and now actually being a member of the band. Yeah, I've seen a lot. And apparently people are interested in history, so I'm here to uh, share it with you. I had this idea that um, I would just sit down for like a half hour or so and tell you guys the whole story. But then I figured it would, might be kind of fun to do it as a show and tell. So I went deep into the TPOS archives and started pulling materials. And I just kept finding more and more and more stuff because I save everything. Uh, I like to think of myself as an archivist more than a pack rat or a hoarder, but I save everything. So I'm digging deep in the vaults, and I'm just I, I'm just finding more and more things, which means the story just gets more and more involved because everything's got a story. So my one little, what was going to be a thumbnail sketch 
of my involvement my involvement with anti scene has now turned into what I think is going to be a five part mini series going one era at a time. And I figure I'll give it about a half hour, 45 minutes. I'm going to do it once a week, every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which should dovetail nicely with Jeff Clayton's live streams on Tuesdays and Fridays at 5 p.m. So you guys are going to get saturated with anti-scene history for the foreseeable future, because as we all know, our future right now is measured in terms of what's foreseeable and everything is being done until further notice. So until further notice, you are getting mega anti-scene history from me live, Jeff live, and we should also mention Mad Brother Ward's blogging, which is a really cool thing. Mad Brother Ward, guitar player for anti-scene, um, blogs regularly about the current comings and goings and doings and brewings of anti-scene. So you need to check him out. Queen City Stomp Blogspot, I think is the name of it. You will also see links to it on the Mad, on his page on Facebook and also on the Anti-Scene page. So between the three of us, we're going to fill in a lot of blanks and do a lot of coloring by numbers and get a real idea of the, the whole history and the story of this band because it's really something. I mean, this is a band that has gone on nonstop now. Think about that, nonstop. No breaks, no... Well, one little break. And I'm not going to be the spoiler. Jeff will tell you about that. I think he's right on the verge of telling you about that for his Tuesday broadcast. But except for one brief break in the mid-80s, this band's been going non-stop for 36, almost 37 years. The Death Train has been rolling straight at you for this whole time. And there really aren't too many bands on any level who can boast of that. You know, I mean, look at all the bands out there whose histories are peppered with breakups and comebacks and reunion tours and cash-in tours and blah, 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 blah. Anti-Scene has never done anything like that. And um, speaking now as their current bass player, I can say I'm really proud and really happy to be a part of a band that has that kind of ethic and that kind of um, aesthetic that just non-stop Head down, horns up, boom. Eyes on the prize, nonstop ever. So that's really cool. I'm really grateful and really glad to be here. And I'm very happy that everybody out there is uh, listening and watching. I'm going to take a little check right now. Yep, we got people reacting. I guess that means you can see me and you can hear me. So I'm going to start with the show, eh? After doing a little bit of hydration here with some nice Danbury tap water in a bottle. Mm-mm-mm. Ah, I love that fluoride. It's so good. So the question is, as is appropriate for this, the first episode of my History Lesson with Anti-Scene is going to cover the time from when I met them to the time I put out the first release by Anti-Scene on TPOS, my label. How did I meet these guys? How did it happen? How on earth... Did this snot-nosed punk from unincorporated northwest Dade County, Florida, happen to find himself tied to the tracks when the death train was rolling on it? Well, as just about everything in my current history has begun with, it all began with one humble, and I do mean humble, little 45 RPM record. This is by a band that I was in called Broken Talent. We did a three-song EP called Blood Slut. The three songs on it were Blood Slut, My Old Man, and My God Can Beat Up Your God. And I expect a big pop from the audience at the mention of the song My God Can Beat Up Your God. And we'll get into depth about that one in a forthcoming episode of Malcolm Tent's History Lesson. But for the time being, here we are in early 1984 with myself and my band Broken Talent and the record we did called Blood Slut. Now, the South Florida scene in the early 80s was actually pretty cool. There were a lot of really good bands, um, a lot of support for each other. Not too many places to play, but um, the places that we did have to play were really cool. The problem is that in South Florida at the time, the options were really limited. 
we were down way at the very end of the South Florida Peninsula in Dade County, which is like basically Miami, south of Fort Lauderdale. So you're at the very tip of the very long peninsular structure of Florida, and there's nothing. I mean, at the time especially, nothing between Miami and the rest of the world. We really were isolated down there. And um, we were acutely aware of the fact that we were totally surrounded by hostile forces. Uh, South Florida was then, and I'm sure still is now, a really reactionary, backwards place. Um, and anybody who was trying to do anything good with music or art or culture was, I think, doing so against considerable odds. Like, in spite of the, the group of people that we had that were in bands and publishing zines and doing radio and coming to the shows and putting out records and everything, in spite of the community that we had, we were definitely encircled. And um, there was always this sense, um, as far as I perceive it anyway, of intense pressure coming from our surroundings. If you were in South Florida and you stayed there, you most likely weren't going to get anywhere or do anything or go anywhere. You're probably going to have a lot of fun with your band, have a really good time, and then your band would break up and that would be it. And I really wasn't thinking about it that consciously at the time, but I knew that I wanted to get out of South Florida. I just, I did not want to be marooned in South Florida. I did not want to have my band's activities confined to just South Florida. I wanted to go places and th see things and, and do things and meet people and go to really exotic foreign climes and just see what there was out there and, and play with bands who I'd never seen before and hear music I'd never heard before. I wanted to experience it all. And luckily having a band, the way I saw it, gave you an automatic ticket to do so because you could go on tour. You could take your band and go on tour. And um, even for a band such as ourselves, which had only been around at this time for just a few months and had one dinky little record out, it was possible, at least, that you could hit the road and take your act out there and show it to people and um, just go somewhere and do something. So I set about doing that. And you might wonder, well, how does one do that? You know, because this is 1984 we're talking about. This is pre-internet. This is pre-cell phone. In a lot of ways, this is even pre-answering machine. Like an answering machine was a fairly exotic commodity in early 1984. How did you book a tour without Facebook, without social media, without, you know, Twitter, without Instagram, without any of this stuff? How'd you do it? Well, basically, we did have one really good resource that you, that you could rely on, and that was regular and was dependable and was a fountain of information. And it was, this is a mock-up of what that was, a really priceless, invaluable magazine called Maximum Rock and Roll. Even in a place like South Florida, you could go to the cool record store and find Maximum Rock and Roll. And even if you couldn't find it at the local record store because you didn't, you didn't have one or the record store didn't stock it, you could still subscribe to Maximum Rock and Roll and have honest-to-God news from the outside world delivered right to you. And you could read it and you could study it. You could learn about bands and you could, you could really enrich yourself through this. My favorite thing about Maximum Rock and Roll was a feature that they had every month called the Scene Report. The scene report was great because people from literally all over the world would write to Maximum Rock and Roll and just talk about what was happening in their local scenes, in their locality. They would write about bands, places to play, new releases. They would send photos. You could read the local scene report and find out what was happening somewhere. And a lot of times, the person writing the scene report would say, hey, I book shows, or I know someone who will book shows. Give this person a call. Give that person a call. Write me a letter. I'll help you out. I'll hook you up. Networks were built around this through the Maximum Rock and Roll scene reports. And so every, every month, 
prior to my deciding to book this to book this tour for Broken Talent, I would comb Maximum Rock and Roll and read the scene reports and try to figure out who was where and where we could realistically go. And um, my reach just about was the same as my grasp. I figured if we could play a few shows like in Georgia and the Carolinas, we'd be fine. So looking through Maximum Rock and Roll, I saw a scene report for Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was written by a guy named Jeff Clayton. And Jeff Clayton, of course, talked about his band, Anti-Scene, and the various other bands that there were. And in his scene report, he said, write me and I'll see if I can help you out with a show. So I wrote him. And we established a little correspondence. And he said that he could hook up a couple of gigs for us. Awesome. So he went ahead and he booked a couple shows. And we, in Broken Talent, hopped in our two-car caravan and drove up to North Carolina, straight from Florida. And our first gig was in Chapel Hill. That was set up by a guy named Simon Bob Sinister, who was the lead singer for a band called the Ugly Americans. And he later ended up in Corrosion of Conformity. And we basically loitered, loitered around his house for a week, completely overstayed our welcome, and then headed to Columbia, South Carolina, where Jeff Clayton had booked a show at this place called The Beat. And um, it was Broken Talent, Anti-Scene, and this guy Brian Douglas Clemens, who we took along to do uh, this spoken word thing in conjunction with us. And um, I had never heard Anti-Scene prior to this. I didn't know anything about them. I never met Jeff or Joe or, you know, any of the guys at the time. I just knew that they were the dudes who were playing with us, and they helped us set up the show. So that's really cool. So we get to Columbia, South Carolina. We get to the venue, which is the beat. It was my first experience having to load equipment up a long flight of steep stairs, because in South Florida, you don't really have stairs. But once you get out of South Florida, there's lots of stairs, and they're all over the place, and they're quite often steep. So I learned firsthand what it was like to haul a great big bass amp up a steep flight of stairs to a venue. Um, we basically had to supply everything for this gig, because the venue didn't have a PA, they didn't have a sound man, they didn't have anybody, anybody to run the front door and take, the, you know, take money and you know, charge admission and all that. So we had to supply all that ourselves. Uh, Jeff found a place to rent a PA. I think he found the place to rent the PA. It might have been me, but I think it was him. I'm pretty sure it was him. It had to have been him. And um, this guy showed up with a PA that was massive. This was like a huge concert-sized PA that we had to pay for. We had to rent this thing for 100 bucks. And considering that all, all bands were being paid from the door, that was, eh, you know, a bit of a knuckle biter. It was kind of, you know, a eh, hundred bucks. Where are we going to get a hundred bucks? I hope we make a hundred bucks tonight. Otherwise, we're all going to lose money. But whatever. Show must go on. We did this gigantic PA for a hundred bucks. And they loaded the thing in. And it devolved upon me somehow for some reason that I was going to be the guy working the door to take tickets and charge admission and all that. And the way the venue was set up was you walked up those long stairs to the landing. And I seem to recall being set up in a little ticket booth on the top of the landing. And then there was a hallway behind the ticket booth and you made a left and then there was the, the room where the show occurred. So there I was in the ticket booth and anti-scene began their set. And I must reiterate that this PA was massive. It was a huge PA. It was gigantic. So anti-scene began their set, and I just hear this din coming from the, from the room behind me. I mean, it was loud, and it was harsh. It was just like... <sighs> blasting down this little hallway. And, um, yeah, it was really something. I, you know, I'd heard plenty of punk and hardcore by this point, but the anti-scene was something a little bit different. I, I couldn't quantify what it was, but it was, 
it was loud and it was harsh and it was loud and it was harsh. So I was mildly intrigued by this as I sit there in the little booth collecting the three dollars from whoever might have showed up. And after a while, all of a sudden this smoke started billowing out of the room and coming down the hall and rolling its way past the, um, the ticket booth. And I thought, hmm, where there's smoke, I don't know what there is where there's smoke. I better find out. So I temporarily abandoned my post in the ticket booth and like went my way through the smoke and into the room. Just in time, I got to witness the Destructo finale with smoke bombs and mannequin heads and guitars being smashed and drums kicked over and screeching feedback. And I seem to remember Jeff with a pilgrim hat and a long coat and just this din. I, and I can't, I got to reiterate again, this, this is the biggest PA I've ever seen in my entire life let alone heard a band play through outside of like, you know, going to the Coliseum to see a big concert. This was loud and this was destructo anti-scene with the treble turned up to 10 and no bass in the guitar. It sounded like a giant electric razor going off and it was just maddening with all the smoke and the flames and shards of wood and glass flying all over the place. And I was like, God damn, we have to follow this? We? Broken talent? We have to try to follow that? I don't know, man. I'm feeling rather pessimistic about this. But uh, as I mentioned before, the show must go on. <laughs> All right, fine. So we wait literally for a while, literally for the smoke to clear so we can play our set. Which we do. You know, I think we acquitted ourselves fairly well. I mean, Broken Talent was always kind of a shambolic mess always on the verge of falling apart sometimes we did sometimes we didn't it was fun um certainly the loudest show we ever played we we attempted to make a recording of our set with a, a portable walkman and listening to it afterwards was just like <coughs> because the pa that we had rented was so huge and so loud it totally blew out the tape recorder so if it did that with our little slice of chaos, you can imagine what it was like hearing anti-scene through that. So that was one hell of an introduction to the band that my fate would be intertwined with for the next 36 years or so, the almighty anti-scene. They pretty much literally blew me away and literally blew away anybody who was in that room that night. Um... The irony is our our tour path was always within a day or two of either the Exploited or JFA. They Those two bands were on tour at the exact same time we were. So we were always in a town either a day or two after the Exploited or a day or two before JFA and the Sun City Girls or some permutation thereof. If I recall correctly, we were a day or two after the Exploited in Columbia, South Carolina. So attendance was a little bit light, but miraculously enough, people did show up to where we could pay for the PA. Um, I think we just about broke even that night, but we made friends with Anti-Scene, and that was important. Jeff had booked another show for us in North Carolina. I don't remember where it was. I do remember it was like some kind of pretty heavy cowboy bar. And it might have been in Charlotte. I don't know if it was the Yellow Rose. Um, I, I don't remember. I do remember, though, that we had a follow-up gig with Anti-Scene in North Carolina at this really heavy country-western cowboy joint. And I remember we drove to the place and we found it. We walked in, and all these cowboys did the... routine like all heads swiveled over to us these scraggly scrawny long-haired scruffy icky little grunge punkers from florida our drummer Catherine was already there she was like out of all of us the most normal person in the entire touring party so there's Catherine over in a 
a table just kind of like, yeah, I hope something happens and I hope it's not bad and I hope it's good and I hope it happens really soon. You know, with all the cowboys kind of like, you know. So we walk in and the vibe is heavy and it's kind of hairy. Um, no anti-scene. Don't know what's going on. I finally called Jeff Clayton and said, what's up? Using the, the pay phone at the bar. And it turns out the gig had gotten scrubbed like last minute for some reason the, the venue pulled the plug on it and it wasn't going to happen so we didn't get to play a second show with anti-scene Mach 1 but it wasn't due to lack of trying pardon me for one second got to get my fluoride going and I'll mention too in terms of um, show and tell I just mentioned the pay phone at the bar in Charlotte. And that was the only way that you could communicate with people in the pre-internet, pre-cell phone age was to take this device that that stuck out of your wall. It was like this kind of big plastic thing. It stuck out of your wall. It was called a telephone. And you would pick up this receiver thing. It had a cord on it. And if you were like really advanced or really luxurious, the cord might be as long as six feet if you could afford to pay for a six foot cord. So you'd have this big thing sticking out of your wall and a handset and you could like maybe walk around a six foot radius of where this telephone was. And you would talk to people that way. And the way it worked was if you made a long distance call, you had to pay by the minute. And at the end of the month, you'd get this, you'd get one of these things right here. This is, this is a phone bill. A lot of you youngins might not recognize this. You've probably never seen one, and I hope you never do. This is a phone bill. And you'd get one of these every month using that weird device sticking out of the, the wall in your, your kitchen. You'd get this at the end of the month, and it would detail who you called, where they were, how long you spoke to them for, and what the charge per call was. I don't know if you guys can see this, but my phone bill for the month where I was booking the Broken Talent Tour. Look at that figure. Look at that. $335.56. I'm going to repeat that. $335.56. And that's 1985 money. That's when a comic book cost 40 cents. That's when a Slurpee cost 59 cents. That's when a McDonald's hamburger costs 39 cents, you know? I might be exaggerating, but you know what I mean. That's what I had to spend in one month in order to book a tour. And if you can see that number down there in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's Jeff Clayton. And that call to Jeff Clayton cost me 29 cents. So imagine 29 cents times nine pages of this. That's what you had to do to book a show in 1984-85. God damn. So think about that next time you gripe about your $35 a month phone plan. But I digress. We booked the shows. I was completely blown away by anti-scene. We stayed in touch. In fact, I remember calling Jeff the next day before we split back to Florida. I thought I was talking to Joe Young, the guitar player. I, I still didn't know who Jeff Clayton was or, or Joe Young was or anybody. I just knew I, I was talking to somebody from Anti-Scene, and I assumed it was the guitar player. So we were talking, you know, saying goodbye, we'll stay in touch, blah, blah, blah. And I said, by the way, man, you guys better keep your lead singer, because that guy is incredible. And the voice on the end of the phone said, oh, that's me. I'm the lead singer. I said, ah, well, you better stay with that band because they're pretty good too. And apparently they took my advice because here we are 36 years later still talking about them. So that was it. We survived our first experience with the anti-scene with the smoke and the flame and the mannequin heads and the smash guitars and the smash scrub boards and the 111 decibels of zero bottom ends going <laughs> at the ears. And it was pretty damn cool. So, whew, a little quid pro quo time came later in December, I think it was, of 1984, October of 1984. The date being, look at that, October 5th, 1984, 
almost exactly the one year anniversary of anti scenes formation, they said they wanted to come down to Florida. Or maybe I invited them. I forget exactly what it was. I think I might have invited them to come down to Florida. Because, as mentioned before, we had a scene. It was a very hard scrabble scene. It was very hit or miss, touch and go. And venues were kind of thin on the ground. So what we would do is find places wherever we could to book shows. And we had an inn at this theater at the University of Miami called the Brockway Theater. And we would promote shows there. So as I recalled it, as I recall it, I invited Auntie Scene to come down and play a show at the Brockway Theater. And this is a flyer for that show, October 6th, 1984. So they came down. They drove all the way from Charlotte to the very southern bit of Miami, to South Miami, to play this gig at the Brockway Theater in Miami. And um, as I recall, this is the first, like, serious road gig they ever played and i know that they had played out of town shows in the carolinas but as far as i know this is the first time they ever really hit the road in earnest to play like a, a serious show way 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 far away um and charlotte to uh, south miami that's a long haul and they did it they drove to my south miami played the show and drove back and, of course, Broken Talent was on the bill. Our good friends Morbid Opera. Um, our little brother band, Lethal Yellow. Pop Cruds, which were um, real... Oh God, they were so good. And I'm pretty sure it was actually Public Distraction, not Public Disturbance. Public Distraction was the name of the band. And uh, my main man, Serge, made the flyer. And we did this show, which really was... A, it was a total guerrilla show. At this, at this big theater in South Miami. The university knew nothing about this. The university did not sanction it. They did not condone it. If they had known about it, they would have chucked this all out. So it was totally underground. In fact, I seem to recall that the professor who sort of wink, wink, let us open the front door and do this, got into some, got into some kind of trouble for this somewhere down the line. But we did do the show. The bands were great. And this is the first time I actually got to see the anti-scene destructo pageantry in all of its destructive pageant. I saw the smoke and the flames. I heard the 111 decibel screech of Joe Young's electric razor guitar. I saw the sword fight with guitars at the end. Jeff Clayton and Joe Young having a sword fight with guitars. I saw the smashed scrub board, which was a glass scrub board. Jeff Clayton sliced his finger open pretty good on that glass scrub board, I remember. So there was blood, real blood, real smoke, real flames. People completely annihilated, myself included. And, um, yeah, Mach 1 anti-scene live on almost exactly the first year anniversary of their existence at a theater completely on the DL at the University of Miami with a bunch of South Florida bands. That was also really cool. And one of my very favorite memories of that night was after everything was over, and once again the smoke had literally cleared, and we were back behind the building. We'd settled up everything. Everybody got paid, and Jeff Clayton was propped up on the loading dock against the wall, asleep. He, like, totally sat there and fell asleep with all this blood oozing out of his finger on his hand, and he had just this most beatific smile on his face, just the most calm, peaceful, just like a babe in his mother's arms, smile against the wall on a loading dock after this gig where they had just completely destroyed everything, and he was bleeding from his hand. Ah, what a night. And uh, I talked to Jeff a little while later on the phone, you know, the big device hanging out of your wall. And uh, he said, man, we had the best time driving back, man. We stopped at a hotel and we trashed that place. We wrecked that hotel, man. We destroyed it and then we split. And I was like, the rock and roll lifestyle, man. Anti-scene, we're living it from the get-go. 
drive from Charlotte to South Florida and back to play one show and destroy a hotel room on the way back. Man, oh man, that is truly living it. So, there you go. That was the, my initial encounters with Anti-Scene. We stayed in touch. I was working at a record store by then called Open Books and Records. And they sent me copies of the Drastic EP when it first came out. I had, I think, five copies of it, which I put on sale at the store. I tried to get everybody I possibly could to buy it. Um, great record to this day. Timeless classic record. I used to love to play guitar along with that record when I was learning how to play guitar. Excuse me, Drastic was one of my go-to platters. I'd throw that thing on the on the record player and play along with Queen City Stomp. She's part of the scene, absent-minded, destructo rock, nothing's cool, all those songs. I literally used the Drastic EP to teach myself how to play guitar. All two finger, not even bar chords, just two finger chords, two fingers, two strings, two frets, up and down, up and down to the Drastic EP. So that was a pretty valuable tool for my musical upbringing. And the people who I turned on to, turned that record, turned on to that record, really liked it, really dug it. So hopefully we're casting seeds out there with the Drastic EP. So that was 84. In 1986, I made the big leap from South Florida. I finally escaped South Florida. I met the woman who had become my wife. We got hitched in a classic May to September romance. And we hopped in her Jeep and we busted out of South Florida and got ourselves up to Danbury, Connecticut, where we opened up a record store. The record store was called Trash American Style. It opened up in November of 1986 and had a really good 21-year run before the landlord chucked us out. And um, the story of Trash American Style and myself and Anti-Scene would, of course, become intertwined. So, staying in touch with the, with the guys the whole time, and it was in the year 1989 that um, through my label, TPOS Productions, and I think maybe you can hopefully see a very small little logo there, the TPOS Productions imprint. I began TPOS to release the aforementioned Broken Talent record and kept the label going after I moved to Connecticut. And through my activities, tape trading, and um, wanting to release stuff, I acquired the production masters for a really cool set of compilation cassettes. Hold on one second. I'm back. It was a pair of cassettes called War Between the States. Ooh. And War Between the States was divided into North and South. And this was a compilation set that was advertised all the time in... Maximum Rock and Roll! I used to read about it all the time and I always wanted to send away for it, but I never quite did because when I was a kid in South Florida, money was always really tight and I you know, couldn't afford to do stuff like that. But through my tape trading, I actually acquired the Production Masters for these two compilations. I got the Production Masters and the Production Artwork for these. And immediately put them into production and released them on my label. And what's worth noting about this is that if you look at the track listing for the War Between, Sa War Between the States South... Whoops, that's North. Well, I should mention North. Look at the great bands in the North. Sacred Denial, The Burnt, Vatican Commandos, Insanity Defense, Bodies and Panic, White Pigs, G.G. Allen, I'm sure you know that name, Urge Overkill, Verbal Assault, Verbal Assault, Sloppy Seconds, Psycho. That's a pretty damn good compilation. Still in print on TPOS, just saying. The South Edition... Also still in print on TPOS, just saying. 
Ooh, who's on this one, man? Wow, Power of the Smoke and Word. Landlords, Maggot Sandwich, Death Party, Jaws of Life, Active Ingredients, Born Without a Face, Rhythm Pigs, and Anti-Scene. Aha! So in the year 1989, kind of by happenstance, the first TPOS release featuring Anti-Scene, a compilation from the summer of 1985. The tracks that Anti-Scene put on this were uh, Meat Market, which is an outtake from the Destru uh, from the uh, ra uh, help me from the um, Drastic EP, plus Queen City Stomp and Destructo Rock, which were taken straight off the vinyl of the Drastic EP. You can actually hear the vinyl surface noise from the record on this cassette. But the version of Meat Market on here was available only on this tape for a very long time. I'm pretty sure it's the same version that's on the uh, Drastic Sessions 12-inch album, which is a really excellent extended LP version of the Drastic EP. It's got the first Drastic EP on side one and all the outtakes on side two. All killer, no filler. So I'm fairly sure that the version of Meat Market that appears on this is the same version that's on the Drastic Sessions 12 inch. Nevertheless, for a long time, you can only get it here and it's still in print, it's still on TPOS, and this is the first thing I ever released by Anti-Scene on my label. Kind of by default, but it did happen, it was there, this is it. Great compilation, killer artwork by R.K. Sloan, the great R.K. Sloan, real quality stuff. Available for me, just saying again. So that was 1989. What happens next in 1989, you might ask? Well, let me tell you. It's now the summer of 1989. It's five years since I first crossed paths with Anti-Scene. We've been in touch the whole time. Jeff Clayton called me one day and said, we want to come up north and play some shows. Can you help us? I said, absolutely. Anything you want, anything you need, I'll do anything I can for you. So they had shows booked, um, probably Philly. They had a gig booked at the CBGB Canteen in New York City. And I, uh, at the time in Danbury, there weren't any venues. But I did get them a spot on WXCI, which was the local college radio station. And at the time, XCI was a real powerhouse. I mean, it was like one of the leading college radio stations at the time, like the entire country. And there was a really excellent show called Large With Everything, which was hosted by a guy named Greg Vegas. And Greg Vegas is still out there, man. He's still working in the music business. He's still doing work with bands. I'm pretty sure he still does radio. So Greg Vegas, if you're out there, mazel tov, man, a real lifer. Greg offered to host Anti-Scene on his radio show, which was broadcast on a Sunday night. And the engineer was a guy named Tom Monahan. And if you look up Tom Monahan, you'll see that Tom Monahan went on to have a very long and illustrious career in production. He's produced some really, really cool bands. And I'm pretty sure he's still at it. So salute to Tom Monahan, who one of his very first engineering gigs was for this anti-scene live radio broadcast we did. So they came, uh, <laughs> they came to the station, set up in a very small room. Not in not in the not in the uh, the DJ room itself, but in like a uh, a reception room. Anti-scene set up in a very small room. Turned everything up to 11, as usual. Cranked it up and played a set. And I interviewed them on the air. And as far as I know, that was the first time... I'm not sure if they played Philly beforehand, but I'm pretty sure that was their first show north of the Mason-Dixon line. If it wasn't the very first show, it was one of them. 
So, wow, look at that. I, I booked their first ever road show, which is in Miami, and I got them north of the Mason-Dixon for the first time. Gee whiz, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I think I'll just beat my chest and say mea culpa for a couple of minutes now. Ha <laughs> ha, mea culpa. Mea culpa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. So, they played the radio station. They played the CBGB canteen. And as is my habit, I recorded the broadcast and I brought my recording devices to the CBGB canteen and I taped everything. Kids, if you don't know me by now, I gotta tell you something that is true and has been true since day one and will be true until I enter the Pine Box Derby and they throw my body in a ditch somewhere. I tape everything. I record every show I go to, every show I play, every band, everywhere, all the time. It's my only joy in life. It's all I got. Just taping bands. It's all I do, man. I tape bands. I record them. In the old days, I'd record them on cassette. I'd throw the cassettes in a box, kind of like this one, which is the original anti-scene box from, uh, this has been in the works for many, many years. Put them in a box, put the box on a shelf, and either forget about them or listen to them occasionally or try to find some kind of use for them. The latter is what happened with the anti-scene recordings that I made in July of 1989. Because after the boys got back to Charlotte, Jeff and I were talking on the phone. He said, man, I would love to release an album of the shows we played in Danbury and in New York City. Would you want to release something like that on TPOS? I said, yes. Yes, I would love to release something like that on TPOS. Let's make it happen. So I sent him the tapes, and he went through them all. And over the course of editing everything, and like, because I remember some of the performances at the radio station, like the guitar was way out of tune. Um, there were some technical difficulties here and there. The original idea for the album ended up being a 7-inch. So that is how this little gem of a jam came about. The WXCI live radio broadcast. Danbury, Connecticut, July 23rd, 1989. Jeff edited the tapes down and he sent me a master with Up All Night, Ruby Ruby Get Back to the Hills, Hippie Punk, Wife Beater, Interview with Malcolm Tent, all from the WXCI broadcast, and then a bonus version of Drug Through the Mud, live at the CBGB Canteen, which was a week after the XCI broadcast. Our good friend Sarah Hubenthal took the front cover photo that's live at the CBGB Canteen. She got a whole roll of photos from that night. I hope they still exist. Sarah, if you're out there, we'd love to see them. And we pressed it up on TPOS. Jeff not only did the layout for the cover, but he actually printed the sleeves. I think that he had an in of some sort at a print shop down there and uh, printed the sleeves and sent them to me. And we made 500 of them. And this is an original one. As is my... Um, as is my habit, I saved everything. I might have mentioned that before. Save everything. I, uh, my habit is to save, in good circumstances, a box of every TPUS release. Sometimes 10, sometimes just a few, and quite often they get frittered away over the years. But I saved a few of these. And this is an actual original TPUS archival copy of the uh, anti-scene WXCI 7-inch. TPOS number 38. This was the first piece of vinyl I pressed after the Blood Slut 7-inch. It took me five years to press vinyl after my first one. And Anti-Scene broke the ice for that. So this is kind of significant for me in a lot of ways because it was the first Anti-Scene vinyl I ever pressed. 
the second vinyl of anybody I ever pressed. And I've pressed a lot of vinyl since then. And we're going to be dressing a lot of that in future installments of the history lesson. Because a lot of that vinyl is anti-scene related. Trust me on that one, kids. If you're a collector, you know. So this is the Regulation 7-inch that we did. This came out in uh, April of 1990. That's the first pressing, first and only pressing, 500 copies. Jeff, it took Jeff a long, long time to reissue this one for a while. He told me this was the only thing that he'd never actually reissued. Because you know that there's the comprehensive anti-scene reissue series on TKO. And this one was the last one to actually get reissued. It did finally come out. I think it's on the uh, Blood of Freaks expanded version. But it is out. You can get it. This is raw as hell. This has got the electric razor guitar sound. Tons of natural distortion on every instrument. Everything's overloaded. Everything's pegged. This truly is noise for the sake of noise. And um, if that sounds like a commercial, great. I mean, I, ha I don't, you know, I don't have anything. This, is, this, is, this has been out of print for decades, but you need it. Find that Blood of Freaks reissue that has these tracks on it. And if I'm wrong, correct me, but I know it's out there somewhere. So that's the regular pressing. All you collectors out there are going to love this kind of stuff. This is the test pressing. This was pressed at a place called, um, I believe they were just called Georgia Record Pressing. And they were in Atlanta, I'm pretty sure. I seem to recall that my main dog, Jim Johnson, used to work there. Don't know if he handled this particular project, but this is the test pressing of the Anti-Scene WXCI radio broadcast. I think there's three of these total. The regulation number that was made was three. One of three, I might still have the other two. I'd have to do some serious digging to see if that actually exists, but one of three test pressings. This is another, this is fun. I may, I, since, you know, I name checked WXCI earlier, I might as well really name check WXCI. Um, I figured it would be really cool to send out promo copies of the seven inch. And I used to hang out at WXCI quite a bit. And I saw what happened to 45s, a.k.a. 7-inch singles, that people would send them. They usually just got lost or destroyed or whatever. 7-inchers always got lost in a shuffle somewhere. They'd fall through the cracks, whatever. Pardon me. Thank you for pardoning me. So I thought, well, if I'm going to send promos of this thing out, I, I want to make sure that they don't get lost. And I saw that one way that WXCI kind of circumvented that problem was they would take a 12 by 12 piece of cardboard and tape the 7 inch single to the cardboard and then file it in on the shelves with all the LPs so it wouldn't get lost. So I thought, great, I'm going to make promo versions of the anti-scene WXCI 7 inch and I'm going to package it as a 12 inch. And so that's what I did. I, um, I got some 12 inch covers, printed the artwork in 12 by, you know, 12 by 12 format. And then if you can see this, taped the 45 to the inside of the cover. So you could uh, remove it. This hasn't been out of this thing in like 40 years or however long it's been. So you could have the seven inch packaged like an LP. And I made, uh, according to my notes here, the notes say the second and last 12-inch promo sleeve for a 7-inch record, pain in the butt to make. And according to my notes, finished 12, uh, 10.49 p.m., October 18th, 1990. So we're coming up on 30 years for this thing. Yes, I only made two because they were indeed a real for Schlugener pain. I gave one to WXCI. Who knows where that went? Greg Vegas, do you know? It went to XCI. Maybe, I think Kitty Catwoman's probably got it. I think Catwoman's got it. I think Catwoman ended up with the entire XCI library. Kitty, if you're out there, please look for this. I'd like to get it back. I'd love to get this one back. Thank you very much. 
Gave one to XCI, put the other one in the TPOS vault. Human eyes have not seen this thing since 1990. So there it is. Now, another variant that we have on the anti-scene WXCI radio broadcast is one that kind of lives along, lives on in the lore of TPOS and anti-scene collecting, and that is the 8-track. Yes, the anti-scene 8-track version, which I, I got to admit, I took some artistic license with this one. Because the original idea I had was to release the the album and call it Anti-Scene Conquers the North. Um, I just love that title so much I couldn't get rid of it, so I called the 8-track Anti-Scene Conquers the North. I started releasing 8-tracks purely as a reaction to CD snobbery. Because I love vinyl, I've always loved vinyl. Vinyl is my favorite mode of expression. And at this time, the record companies, the major labels, were making a concerted effort to wipe out vinyl and force CDs on the public at a hyperinflated price. It was, it was a really gross, disgusting thing that they did in attempting to get rid of vinyl. And one of the, the cheap ploys that they used with CDs was to put bonus tracks on the CD that you couldn't get on vinyl. So I said, you know what? Fuck that. I'm going to do my own thing with 8-tracks, because I love 8-tracks. 8-tracks are cool. 8-tracks, they rattle. When they've been in the player for a long time, they start to heat up. They smell good. They sound good. You get that chunk between tracks in the middle of a song. On the major label releases, they fade the song out for five minutes, and you hear the chunk chunk. And it fades back in. And it's totally ridiculous. But I love these things. So I said, all right. Here's my answer to CDs. An 8-track with exclusive bonus cuts that you can't get on any other format. Not on the vinyl. Certainly not on CD. Because I ain't going to release it on CD. And I wasn't doing cassettes at the time. So whatever. So the 8-track has um, my approximation of what the full album would have been. It's got... All the usable songs from the CBGB show and from the WXCI broadcast and the unedited interview. At least I think it's what's on there. It's been a long time since I've looked at this. Yeah, it's got all the extra songs and the long interview. So if it had come out as a full-length album, it probably would have been something like this, I guess. But it's on 8-track. The 8-track has basically never been out of print. It's pretty much always been in print since day one. The problem with the 8-tracks is that they are a real pain to make. They're very time-consuming. They're very labor-intensive. In order to make one of these things, I have to go through a lot of steps. And even after going through the steps, they still will jam up in the machine while they're recording. Or they'll jam up when I take them out of the recorder. It's like the failure rate on these things is a, is a cool 50% minimum. So there were a lot of, lot of work and uh, supplies of old blank 8-tracks or catch-as-catch-can. So it's always been in print, but not always easy to find. But I got them. They're here. Just saying. And that pretty much wraps up the first era of my involvement with Anti-Scene, getting us up right from the very beginning days of the early 80s when I first met them at that fateful gig in Columbia, South Carolina, to the very dawn of the 90s when I started to release records by them. And um, I'm going to wrap this segment up with one more release. This was from 1991, I believe. No, actually, 1990. 1991. Somewhere around that. You can look it up on Discogs and find out for sure. Whew. We had done the anti-scene WXCI release. And one day, Jeff Clayton called me up and said, what's your mailing address? Gave him my mailing address. He said, watch the mailbox. I got something for you. I said, cool. So I went out to the mail mailbox, uh, set up a little lean-to next to it, got out my sleeping bag, and waited. I camped out there day and night 
for about a week and a half. And finally the mailman showed up and said, hey, it's here. Reached into the flap of the lean-to and handed me a little package. And in it was 10 records from Jeff Clayton. I pulled one of the records out. And imagine my surprise when this came out. Yes, the Australian 7-inch on Dog Meat Records. Recorded live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina in 1990. Pretty sure 1990. A little song called My God Can Beat Up Your God. Which brings us full circle to the beginning of today's history lesson. From the original version on the Broken Talent 7-inch, which is why I started touring in the first place, and which is how I met Jeff Clayton, to... The version of My God Can Beat Up Your God that Anti-Scene ruthlessly stole from us and put on a record. Yes, we've come full circle. But not until I tell you about two things. I want to plug two things. I wasn't going to get into plugging too much, but I'm going to plug two things before I wrap up this week's episode of the History Lesson. The very version that Anti-Scene stole of My God Can Beat Up Your God was from a soundboard tape that I made when Broken Talent played CBGB in the summer of 1985. And I'll mention, too, that when, we, when Broken Talent did our second tour in the summer of 1985, Jeff Clayton and Joe Young's apartment was a way station for us. There weren't any gigs to be had in Charlotte at the time, but Jeff and Joe let us crash there on our way up to Albany, New York, and on our way back from Albany, New York, when we were in various states of total starvation and complete impoverishment. They let us crash their place. Um, Jeff and Joe had quite the swinging rock and roll bachelor pad at the time. I remember that Joe was working at... I think record bar in Charlotte. And so he would bring home all, all the promo items from the record bar, all the posters and hang them on the walls of the apartment. He didn't know who they were, or what they were. He would just hang these wall, these posters up on the wall. I remember there was a poster for the three o'clock. If, if anybody remembers the Paisley underground, there was a three o'clock poster. There was a poster for this Polish, Journey REO Speedwagon band called Lady Pank on the wall and some other just various stuff. So Jeff and Joe lived there. I remember that Dana Ace Davis was a part of the scene. He was hanging around. I see now that he's like the head chef at a restaurant in Hawaii somewhere which makes sense because he was a really good cook at the time. And even though we, we were like completely broke and starving and couldn't afford food, he was always volunteering to cook for us, which I thought was very nice. He never actually cooked anything for us. We were supposed to supply the food, but if we had, he would have cooked for us. I remember that. And I remember that there was definitely some little bit of aggro in the air because Dana was the lead guitarist for Anti-Scene at the time. And this is like Honor Among Thieves era. And Dana really, I remember he really wanted to be the lead guitar player. Like in the true sense of lead guitar player. Like, woo, woo, woo in anti-scene. And I remember there was a little bit of conflict about that because that's not the direction that the other guys in the band wanted to go in. And of course, we all know how that resolved itself. But I really remember driving around thinking about food and hearing Dana Ace Davis talk to us about how he really wanted to play lead guitar with Anti-Scene, but they didn't want him to. Um, yeah, my God, hanging out that apartment, starving and broke, and reading the latest issue of Kerrang!, which talked about the new lineup of Black Sabbath with this guy David Donato on lead vocals, and talking about the Hellhammer demos, and how hard they were to find, and just hanging out with Jeff and Joe for days at a time. Um... 
we were so broke, they said that we should go down to manpower and hire us, hire ourselves out as day labor just to get some kind of money, which we thought we were going to do. But it involved getting up at 6 in the morning to go and wait in line, and we didn't want to do that, so we didn't. We just starved instead and somehow made our way back to uh, South Florida. But anyway, while we were hanging out with Jeff and Joe at their swing and rock and roll bachelor pad apartment, I had the cassette of Broken Talent live at CBGB from earlier in the month, July of 85. And um, is this thing on? Hold on for one second. I got to make sure this thing is still on. Yeah, looks like I'm still on. Okay, just making sure. Um, I let Jeff and Joe borrow the cassette of our performance. And I never saw it again, never heard it again. It vanished. Apparently, Jeff let his younger brother, Greg Clayton, a name who you should be familiar with, Greg borrowed the cassette and lost it. And I was always really bummed about that because the the cassette documented one of the few like really good semi-tight performances we ever did. And I hated to lose that. And that thing was gone for years and years and years and years and years until finally one day Greg Clayton called and said, you're not going to believe this. I was going through some old tapes. I found this old mixtape I made for a friend of mine, and it's got some of the songs from that Broken Talent live cassette you gave me. And I was like, I'd love to hear it. So he sent it to me on a CD, and yes, indeed, it had three songs from the CBGB performance, including... The very version of My God Can Beat Up Your God that Jeff Clayton and Joe Young listened to in their swing and rock and roll bachelor pad and decided to base their cover version on. Anti-Scene did not base their cover version on the original vinyl. They based it on the live cassette from CBGB, which then vanished for many, many years. So Greg Clayton sent me the three songs from it, and I thought that the version of My God Could Beat a Beer God was historically important enough and good enough to actually put on this thing right here, which I wasn't going to plug, but fuck it, it fits into the story, and it's here and it's now. Um, I know it's really weird times, and I felt kind of strange about trying to plug a new release, but... You know, here it is. I pressed this thing five months ago, and I've been waiting for a time to tell everybody about it. Well, here it is, the Malcolm Tent solo album, which is not just me, but it's many of the bands I've been in since 1984, including the King Hatreds, Funny Brains, Bobby, They Hate Us, featuring P.P. and Dino from the Murder Junkies, uh, my contribution to a Residence album, me playing with Devo's drummer, uh, an exclusive unreleased live track by the almighty Anti-Scene, featuring the current lineup, thank you very much, and the original version of My God Can Beat Up Your God by Broken Talent from the cassette that Jeff and Joe pillaged and Greg Clayton lost, but then found again. So it's all here on an LP. Exciting colored vinyl, which I don't know if you can see. This is kind of like a blue-gray vinyl. If you want to hear the actual version of My God Can Beat Up Your God that Anti-Scene stole, it's on this album, along with a super hot version of Sabu by the Jeff Clayton, Mad Brother Ward, Sir Barry Hannibal, Malcolm Tent, current lineup of the band. If you want one, hit me up. We'll talk terms. Also, the last plug I'm going to make is, I'm just going to tell everybody right now that Anti-Scene is very much alive and very well. We have a lot of plans for recording, releasing records, and live action for the foreseeable future. I have kind of assumed a position on the Anti-Scene booking committee. So I just want to tell everybody out there who's listening, and I want you all to spread the word about this. Yes, we want to play. Yes, we want to play your town. Yes, we will play your wedding. Yes, 
we will play your New Orleans-style funeral. Yes, we will play your birthday party. Yes, we will play your bar mitzvah. Yes, we will play the local cool venue in your town or your living room. We want to play. We like the idea of doing it as a fan-based, fan-sourced way of doing it. So if you think you can facil uh, facilitate something like this, message me through the anti-scene page. Use our inbox. Uh, if that doesn't work for some reason, message me directly. We want to play. No, we're not cheap. Anti-scene is not a cheap date. On the other hand, we might be more affordable than you would think. So if you can if you can supply us with our financial needs and give us a good PA to play through and a place to do it, we want to play. So hit me up via the anti-scene page or through my own Facebook page. And if you think you can do something, let's talk. We're really into it and we really can't wait to get back out there and rock. And I'm just going to say that this is the first year now. I've been in the band now for officially one year. It's a fanboy's dream come true. And I'm really happy to be here. Absolutely honored and thrilled to be a part of this. And completely blown away and humbled by all you guys out there who have welcomed me into the fold. Thank you. It means everything to me. And I cannot wait to get back on the stage and kick some more ass. It's going to happen. So I'll be back in a week, same time, same channel, 5 o'clock next Sunday with part two of the anti-scene Malcolm Tent TPOS saga covering the 90s. Stay well, stay sane, TTYL. This is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.